Hi, everybody. This is Krista Glenn, Director of Marketing at ABC Omega. ABC Omega is a Buffalo, New York-based global organization specializing in multinational credit and collections. Since 1929, we have been making good on promises for commercial clients around the world, providing a full array of credit-to-cast solutions, including first- and third-party collections, credit, and education services. Thank you for attending today's webinar, How to Create and Maintain a Mentally Safe Work Environment. This is the fifth program in our 2022 webinar series. Welcome back for those of you who have attended any of our previous webinars. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we hope you enjoyed today's program. Handouts for the presentation are available in the GoToWebinar control panel in the handouts section. Today, we are joined by workplace consultant and trainer, Trevina Broussard. Based in Houston, Texas, Trevina specializes in helping companies maximize their workplace potential. Now I'll turn things over to Trevina to get us started. Hi friends and welcome. Um, I'm so excited to be joining you again to talk about this really important kind of concept that really is becoming, um, I would say a hot button issue in the post pandemic COVID world of work. Um, obviously you guys know, and just to kind of bring us all on the same page, the workplace and the workforce has kind of been in this constant state of flux since COVID times. Um, you may have heard words like the great resignation or, um, you know, the, the great flight or any of those things because so much has been happening in our workforce. We've gone from working in the office every day to some people having a hybrid schedule or perhaps, or perhaps even a distributed schedule. Um, so there's been a lot of change. And as much as we'd like to think that we're kind of managing it and going along with it, we are seeing um, some of these kind of fractures in our foundation. One of those really is surrounding our mental health. In fact, some, uh, some consultants are saying that this great resignation that we are coming out of was actually more a result of mentally safe and mentally healthy workspaces than it was about money or any other, you know, your manager, or any other factor that might often uh, cause an employee to move. So what we're going to talk about today is really diving into that. How can we make our workplaces mentally safe, not only for ourselves, but for our coworkers? And if you are people leaders out there, how do you, how do you create this environment for your team? Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Obviously, uh, Krista has already um, taken us through the housekeeping items, but I did want to just say that there is a Q&A portion just to reiterate and um, the recording will be sent to, emailed after. Um, we will be doing a lot of our interaction through um, an app that I use, it's called Slido. To join, you can scan the QR code uh, just right there on your screen. To do that, go ahead and take your smartphone, switch it to camera mode and scan your camera right over it. It'll pull you right into our interactions for today. If you happen to have a, you're at your computer or your laptop and you're able to open up and you wanna join from um, the actual webpage, just go ahead and go to slido.com and go ahead and enter hashtag ABC Omega. I'll give you a second or two. Obviously, if there are any questions about that, you can go ahead and pop that in there. We'll keep an eye on it um, as we're going forward. But that's how most of our interactions will be happening today. If this is your first time hearing me speak, um, as Krista said, my name is Trevina Broussard, um, and I'm passionate about people potential. I own a boutique talent strategy and optimization firm called Sula Sage Talent Group. And one of the things we've been excited to do since kind of the pandemic and, and since our inception is really creating teams that work better in the new world of work. Our agenda for today in the simplest terms is um, what is psychological safety? Um, like I said, it's kind of a new term for, for in the workplace, in the mainstream, but it's actually an, a very um, embedded and old concept. So we'll review a little bit of that. Um, the next is, is why is this concept of psychological safety important in the workplace? I'll dive in that a little bit and, and help you understand how it actually um, 
creates better and more innovative teams and how it makes you a better worker, right? Having that balance. Um, I do want to dive into a little bit of stigma and resilience. Um, often when we start to talk about mental health, and I do want to give credit to where credit is due that we, you know, as a society, as a community, we are becoming a lot more accepting and understanding that mental health is part of our whole health, right? You can't separate your brain from the rest of your body. So when we look at that, with look at our health, we should be including mental health. We should be including all of that as part of the whole person. So I want to talk about the stigma and resilience so we can begin to have the concept of we bring our whole self to work. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about how companies can take action, how you as leaders can take action, and of course, how, how you as individual contributors can take action. So we're going to start with the poll. You can go ahead and pull up your Slido. But my question to you is, how familiar are you with the concept of psychological safety? Feel free to go ahead and you can scan it, the QR code or, or join us at Slido and tell us how familiar are you? Are you somewhat familiar? Are you not familiar at all? Are you very familiar? Meaning this is something that you've heard often um, and we'll give it a second as you can see up in the top um, corner here we can see everyone answering and we've got just about all the attendees in so it sounds like the majority of us are it's changing a bit but the majority of us are somewhat familiar meaning maybe we've heard about it in passing um, maybe it's an article that has popped up in our inbox we do have a really good chunk that has never heard about it at all um, and so that is that is uh, what we'll be covering today. We'll be able to dive into that and hopefully for those that are somewhat familiar, you'll be a little bit more action oriented to know how to implement this. And we'll cover those that are not familiar at all. So let's go ahead and get started. The first on our agenda is, is what is psychological safety? Um, this concept of psychological safety actually comes from Harvard Business School professor, Amy Edmondson. And overall, she defines psychological safety as a shared belief held by members of a team that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. Now, I want to want to break that down uh, because when Amy Edmondson came up with this, um, at first it was just a theory, right? It was just a in theory it sounded good, but then we had Google re, uh, had this project Aristotle, and what this was is to fi find out um, what makes teams effective. So Google basically used their workforce as a test ground for testing psychological safety. And what we found is that when team members, um, individual contributors, leaders, uh, executive teams, whenever we feel safe in making a mistake, we're actually more innovative. Whenever we feel safe and trusted in being able to do our work um, without being nagged or without being followed up on, we're actually end up doing more work. So this concept of psychological safety actually might be the key to much of the flux that is happening with the great resignation and having these kind of burnout and quiet quitting as we've kind of heard. Now, I'm going to absolutely use the buzzwords of our time, but what I really want you to understand in here is when I say things like quiet quitting, I really feel like that's more boundary setting in the workplace which if you understand psychological safety, that's what we want. We want you to be able to say, okay, I after six o'clock, I really need to spend time recouping, working out, making dinner, whatever that is. We are really wanting to transform our understanding of the workplace and expectations to have less of an always on and more of a, hey, these are my office hours and I am 100% available during that, but after that, uh, I'll just have to take care of it the next morning, okay? So let me show you some more examples of what this psychological safety is. It starts with authentic and consistent leadership, but it's sustained from all levels of the organization. I say this because it really does have this cascade uh, 
effect. When we're working with different companies and organizations, I always like to have a top-down and a bottom-up approach. It's um, starting with the executive team, making sure that we're all on the same page, and then obviously coming in with our individual contributors um, and helping them understand so that we can meet in the middle. Um, when that's not available in like a webinar like this, you, even you as an individual contributor or whatever your role is within your organization, you can still create a huge impact that can cascade. Some of it is through modeling some of the techniques that you're going to learn today um, and modeling that boundary setting for yourself. Um, so here's some of the things that we, we see from that project Aristotle with Google. It strengthens team bonds. So that, that sense of loyalty that you have to your work, to your project, to your launches, it strengthens that. It enhances the pride in not only your own work, but in your work as a collective and in your accomplishments. Um, you have more openness to have constructive feedback. In many of our organizations, and for a very long time, the American workforce was formed to be very competitive. And I'm not saying that I don't want people to be pushing to their upper limits and to be stretching their potential, but there's also the understanding that to be innovative, we have to understand that there's a stress cycle for our human beings, our whole self. We can't just always be at 100. There's a cycling in that, right? There's an understanding that when we have energy coming in, there also has to be energy coming out. That understanding that if I'm going to be a top performer, I also have to be a top rester as well. I also have to offset it by giving myself time to recuperate. Um, it, it increases productivity. Why? Because when you're in the office, when you're working, when you're on, you're on. Because you know that when you can be off, you're off. It encourages creative problem solving. Of course, when you feel free to say, you know what, that let's try this, let's see if this would work. And you can own that problem and say, hey, it didn't work. Of course, you feel a little bit better in solving problems or um, coming up with ideas to make things better or innovations. It allows for feedback to leadership, meaning it's not just a one way effect. It's not just a top down, it's also a bottom up. So it's not just leadership giving you all of the direction, but it's also the people that are doing the work, the people that are in that project every day, being able to report up and say, hey, this is not working. This is, this is we're finding that there's creating some churn here. We're finding that this is, this uh, process that we have is, is actually no longer effective for everyone. Here's an option for what we can do. Um, many organizations, especially during pandemic time, have lost that ability to have that two-way communication. Um, and not, none of that was intentional. We all responded very quickly, right? The May, middle of May 2020 came and um, leadership teams quickly jumped into action to keep everyone safe and to keep business moving. Um, what's important now is that we are, you know, we're in the, in the realm and in the era of the new world of work. And so it's really about what do we create now that can start to bring that innovation, feedback, and psychological safety into our organizations. Um, and of course, it leads to personal and professional growth because you feel like it's a place that nurtures you. It's a place that is safe for your whole self. And through that, you're obviously able to flourish. I have a little graph. I always think of psychological safety as kind of this nucleus, it's always moving. There's there's a, a, a lot of grace in this. Um, and if you think of that in contrast to our previous uh, workplaces in, in America, um, we, it wasn't a grace-filled situation, right? So uh, this idea of psychological safety and being comfortable admitting your mistakes and having everyone share their ideas openly, learning from failure, um, and creating better innovation and decision making. This nucleus, this kind of ever evolving uh, cascade effect, is really what we're looking for with psychological safety. We're hoping to create that type of atmosphere where when you come to work, even your good days and your bad days, you're accepted, right? You don't always have to be on. We're able to flex and move with you. Um, it isn't. Uh, an, a, it isn't a culture where you feel fear of admitting mistakes. 
um, where there's blaming others, you know, where you're having that concept of uh, who did this wrong. It's it's one of those of like, how can we help all hands on deck, not sharing different views, um, common knowledge effect. For the people managers out there, I know often what you'll see is you'll see a lot of um, problems and or challenges that are presented to your team and somehow they'll bubble up to you. Somehow they'll bubble up to you as the manager. And you're like, why am I handling this problem? You're completely, um, you're completely empowered and equipped to handle it on your own. Things like that, when we see that happening, that's an indication that that safe risk taking is not there, right? So in an instance, just using the same example, that would be an opportunity where you can reinforce that you trust you know, your team to take that action, right? Without having you second guess it or having you have to sign off on it. So having this actually frees up you as a people leader, but also empowers, right? Uh, one of the things we say here at Sula Sage is we really want to create leaders at every level so that it's not just leadership. We're all leaders here. We're leaders in what projects we're working on. We're leaders in what we're spearheading. We're leader, leaders in our responsibilities. And we're leaders in ourself and what it's gonna take for us to work the best. Um, less requirements from our managers to um, you know, have to micromanage or say, hey, it looks like something's going on. We wanna create this two-way street where we trust our teams to handle their work, to handle themselves so that we can as managers, as leaders can handle our work and handle ourselves. So why does this matter at work? Well, research from the National Safety Council actually says when a workplace lacks human connection, employees feel it, anxiety decrease, increases and motivation and morale drops. This lack of human connection, this is that psychological safety component that we're talking about. Um, and when it comes even down, you know, when we drill even deeper into it to understand that there, you know, this mental health is not separated from our, our whole self, our, our health as a whole, our wellness, 63% of those with a mental health condition don't share it with their employer. Um, that's, this is a, this is a statistic that I've had in virtually every presentation I've had since 2020. And every time I come to it, I always want to pause and just make sure you understand the gravity of that. So that means that 63% of those that are working for you have never shared that they have some sort of struggle that might prevent them from showing up fully at work or that might prevent them from being able to be always on as they're required to. And more so might prevent you from being able to step in and help them and offer resources. So in a team where we have psychological safety, we're making those type of things welcome. It's okay to say, I'm having anxiety over this. I'm, you know what, I'm actually battling a little bit of depression. Um, any of those things should be welcomed. Why should they be welcomed? Because most, most wellness plans, most health plans include a lot of resources for this. Um, so, and, and I want you to, you know, as a homework assignment, I want you to check into it. Check into your EAP. Um, those are resources that your company is already paying for. They're already providing. It's often free or no cost, and they'll hook you up with different types of solutions. But often managers don't know that this is a problem and aren't able to point their teams in the right direction. When we look at that nucleus, as I was talking about, of psychological safety, it's creating that common language of instead of you know um, hiding our mental health or our feelings or what we're struggling with, we feel open in sharing that. There is a common language of, hey, this anxiety is accepted, right? Struggle is accepted. Taking risk is accepted. Also, there's that understanding of, of seeking help. And, and off and giving empathy, right? So if you're in a team meeting and you know someone is struggling with something is being able to offer them that space and grace to get through it um, while also pointing them in the right direction for resources. Having that leadership and team support of we're all in this together. 
you know, I, uh, I am beginning to have a small team of my own. And although uh, I've been training and doing this for the last 15 years, I can say that um, I take a special emphasis to understand where they are mentally, where their headspace is. What I'm surprised to find is that it's never, no one is ever just okay. And it doesn't affect their work ever. And so I want you to think about that when it comes to psychological safety. Often our fear is that when we ask our team or our workforce how you're doing, we're going to get like, hey, um, something that's so drastic that's going to prevent them from working. What I'm trying to tell you is that they're already working through it. They just don't tell you about it. Or for yourself, you're already working through it. You're just not telling anybody. So what does that do? That prevents you from getting help. That prevents you from being supported that prevents you from being able to share that vulnerability, which can be a strength in your team because we're all going through it together. Um, so, so yeah, I always love to, to highlight why that matters because it's such a new concept. So now a question for you, how are you contributing to a psychologically safe workplace? Um, you may think of it as support or encouragement, and if that question is, is you know, you can't really arrive at it, maybe because psychological safety is a little bit new to you, um, think about what your coworkers are doing that help you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and click us. We're gonna go back to Slido for this. This is kind of an active, um, you can fill in the blanks, either one word, two words, just go ahead and start submitting some of your ideas. How are you contributing to a psychologically safe work environment? Or how are your coworkers supporting you in that environment? I wanna make sure, I always say this in these type of things where things are being recorded, this is completely anonymous. So please feel free to share. No one is gonna know, even I don't know. Um, we're having some of the answers come in as we go. There's a great one that's popped up, being open and listening. Yeah, I love that, I love that. Um, in, in, you know, I work with a lot of HR groups and often um, HR is feeling like they're becoming kind of the emotional center and they're having to be open and listening. And so the other side of being open and listening is also being able to point people in the right direction so that you don't also become the therapist. Listening, yeah, that's, a, that's one that's coming up. Showing appreci appreciation and asking how people are doing asking and actually listening for the answer that's so great being open to hard conversations with general interest with genuine interest in helping i love that these are hard conversations these are messy conversations these are conversations that often have very little to do with work but they affect how we work and so we have to talk about it it's it we cannot get past it being a sounding board, being supportive to their needs, personally checking in on colleagues. Yeah, I love that. Because as much as we want to pretend like we don't know when something's going on with our coworkers, you know, right? You know when they start being a little shorter or when projects start sliding, something's going on. And it makes it so much more um, effective if we can join them in that. Not join them in the problem, but hold the space hold the psychological space to create um, a place where they feel safe. So making that space, we share a safe place. I love that. That literally is um, what it comes down to. It looks like we have a few more typing. I want to get your answers in. Little positives. Oh, I love this. Whoever wrote that. Having little positive encouragements like it's Friday or the sun is shining after five days of rain. I love that. One of the things that I always say is, um, it's always sunny in 70. So uh, on my team, you know, my perfect temperature when I'm stressing out is I always think it's sunny in 70. It's sunny in 70. Oop, I'm sorry. That's my, my pop-up. Uh, you know, I always tell myself it's sunny in 70. It's perfect weather regardless. And so um, having that mantra or I love that. Uh, we'll let these last comments come in uh, before we move on, but you guys are nailing it. Having open uh, conversations, giving advice when asked. I love it. I love it. You guys have got it. That's exactly what it comes down to.
So what needs to change, right? Like we, we kind of are getting this understanding, but really we want to create a culture of psychological safety that has this trust and community uh, communication. What needs to change? Well, here are some things that we can actually focus on is increase our understanding of mental health, increase our understanding of our EAP systems, um, understand the language, educate yourself so that you know what's going on with yourself and don't gaslight yourself, right? Because this really does start with you and it cascades out to everyone else. It starts with you, it cascades out to your coworkers and your teams um, that you work with. Uh, so it's, it's really something of becoming more aware and understanding what's happening for you. Um, identifying early, many of your EAP um, systems and, and programs have screening tools, resources, um, tips and techniques that you have to dive into. And I, and I wanna say in a post pandemic world, the things that they are including in these EAP systems are so innovative and helpful. So I really want to urge you to, to look into that, to be able to identify it before it becomes a problem. This really comes into, let's talk about that stigma, right? Um, I know it is so, so difficult to move into that realm of vulnerability when it has nothing to do with work. You're not necessarily checking up on a project. It might be, hey, I'm having a rough moment, moment. I'm gonna have a late start today and then I'm gonna tackle this, this, and this. But I trust you. If you work for me, I trust you. If you work with me, I trust you. So having that and kind of removing that stigma that you won't be, there won't be disapproval, there won't be judgment. Also understanding people are very resilient. I think often when I introduce the concept of psychological safety to teams, managers, and individual contributors, there's the idea like, oh my gosh, I'm going to make them soft. You're not, because we're naturally resilient. You know how I know we're naturally resilient? Because 63% of your coworkers are already struggling and not telling you. So the difference is, is if they are able to share it with you, you guys are able to have a tighter connection. You're able to support them which dovetails into our productivity. It dovetails into our bottom line. It dovetails into our, us being able to work together better and be more innovative. So um, I have some more information on stigma. I don't wanna get into the weeds on it, but I have to. I would be remiss not to mention it and also not to reinforce that we are so, so resilient as people. The people on your team are resilient, um, but they're also human and they're also whole. And gone are the days where we could say, you know, check your baggage at the door. I, I bet some of you guys remember that, you know, when I come in, it's business. I check all my stresses at the door. Once we took our workplaces and moved home, that doesn't happen anymore. All of our baggage is surrounding us at all moments, okay? So I just wanted to include this so you understand, yes, there is a stigma, um, but also, we're so, so resilient as, as human beings by design evolutionarily. My next question for you is, how does this stigma regarding mental health show up for you? Um, maybe it's in the words, I you know, a word that I'm beginning to really prick, become prickly or triggered by is crazy. Um, the more work that I do in mental health, the, the less that I like that. Um, so maybe there's some language or some words or different sayings, right? Um, whether it's based on your gender uh, stereotypes, what else? So I'm going to go ahead and take us into um, Slido again, and I'll give you a chance to kind of answer. We may not leave the poll up this long, as long, but if you can kind of quickly put in some of your ideas, like what, how does that stigma regarding mental health show up for you? I'll give you a second or two and we'll allow it to populate, but I want to make sure we get to the, our other slides too. And I do have another question after this. We got a few people typing. Ooh, that's a good one. Bad jokes. It's not real, right? Like, or, or you just need to suck it up, right? Um, uh, here she goes with her anxiety again, um, uh, you know, or, or that it might come back on you, right? Weakness, oh, that's such a good one. That is such a good one. Uh, we don't wanna appear weak. 
in, in the workplace. So if I say, listen, I'm really struggling. Uh, oh, that one right there. Did you take your meds yet? That one personally hurts me because I am a firm believer that if your brain doesn't manufacture the chemicals, it is okay to buy them from the store. Okay. Like if your brain doesn't make those chemicals on their own, um, store-bought is fine. By prescription is fine. Um, but yeah, you guys are nailing it. Um, this is what we're afraid of, right? This is what uh, it being used back at you. Of course, there are protections under the law because these are these are actual health conditions, right? So I want to caution those on the call to not fall in the trap the trap of saying any of these things because anxiety is a protected, uh, you know, disability, and and so you are actually talking about somebody's actual health, and um, it's not okay. It really isn't. Uh, it doesn't create safety. Um, and I feel for those that have had to deal with that. My next question is, um, how might you, right? So if if it came down to a coworker shares something with you, but how might you tell if your team members are struggling when they're working remotely? How can you offer support? And what gets in the way of reaching out? So that's kind of an open question. Go ahead and go to Slido. The next question is already opened. But how might you tell, right? Now we're working more remotely. We're responding via Slack messages. Uh, you know, you have a yellow light, a green light. Oh, her green light's on, that means she's on. Um, like I said, I'm building out my team and we have a mantra here that's embrace the yellow. I, I want people to be mostly away. Um, yeah, they become more quiet. Yeah, they do. How might you tell? They, they suddenly withdraw. One word answers in their voice, that's wonderful. Whoever answered that, I love that because that means that you're actually reaching out and listening and you're in tune. I have a feeling they are probably very sensitive and feel something out of that as well. The change in their, their, their messages received, they're very curt, absolutely. You start getting these terse, uh, these tense um, responses or they're getting less done, less productive. I love that you're saying this because actually when it comes down to psychological safety, when we look at measuring it, when I come into an organization and I want to measure how safe your company feels, how safe, I immediately go to the use of vacation and sick time. I immediately measure how many call outs you get, day of call outs. That means waking up in the morning and saying, oh God, I just can't do it today, right? Like, I know I'm not the only one, but that's how you see it. So if you're a manager and you're like, okay, I'm suddenly seeing these last minute, hey, I'm gonna be out today, I'm gonna be out tomorrow, something's going on. And it doesn't have to be, sometimes it's not a death in the family, sometimes it's not um, you know, something huge, sometimes it's just, listen, I am having a really difficult time managing my investment, my energy here, and everything feels like a lot, okay? And as a manager, I can tell you, I wanna talk about that. I have some tools on, hey, let's, let's talk about how we can narrow your focus and make sure you know exactly what I want you to spend time on. You know, I, I have a team member that literally she's our, um, our she manages our inboxes. And it's like, some of these I don't want you to spend time on. So that overwhelm, I'm so glad you mentioned it because I would love to tell you, hey, this, don't worry about it. This is Friday work, um, inaccurate work, more mistakes, very good, disconnected, less interested. And, and if you think about it, some of these things is what they're saying when they say, are your employees quote unquote, quiet quitting? So when I say, how do you measure it? It really is that idea of, hmm, I can see that your engagement is changing. I can see that your, your communication is changing. That's when you know it's time for an adjustment. So what can leaders and managers do? Like I said, pay attention to the language right? You, it's one of those things that once you're aware of it, uh, you can never go back. And I really do want to challenge everyone on the call today that now that you know what psychological safety is, now that you know how it affects you and how it affects your coworkers, I want to challenge you to pay attention to the language. I've seen what you've shared and I know you guys are already doing a great job. It seems like everyone is already on it but I want you to pay attention to that language, right? 
if you feel strong enough, speak up when you hear that stigma come up. Um, encourage conversations. Be proactive in it, right? Don't wait until, if you can, don't wait until uh, things are falling apart. Share this information that you get today with your teams. Forward them the webinar, forward them the notes, and listen to what's going on. You guys were so great. You put listening a lot in our polls. So I know you're doing a wonderful job. Um, and so we'll talk about how you can, you can take care of yourself too. So what can companies do? Well, you know, as a whole, companies can provide the language and tools to encourage open, productive conversations about mental health and substance misuse. Um, that substance misuse, you will have it in your notes package, but I removed a little bit of it because mental health is difficult to talk about the, the behavioral health component that comes out of it, which means how does mental health affect our behavior, right? How, is it, uh, how does it affect our whole self? So overwhelm arises in us as anxiety. And sometimes that overwhelm can also manifest as depression. So when we talk about mental health, we cannot leave behavioral health because there's always a behavioral outcome from it. One of those can be substance misuse. And so if you're noticing uh, you, you're, yourself is drinking more or using other substances, um, or even your, your managers are noticing it as a coping mechanism that something like this is happening, understanding how to point someone in the right direction is so, so important. Um, lucky for you, like I've said, virtually every uh, wellness program, every health program has an EAP built in, an employee assistance, uh, I can't remember what the P stands for, but it's all to help you as the employee. So um, I also have a, a behavioral health literacy module that um, you can, you know, roll it out for your team. It's something that kind of just brings you up to scale with how do we do these sort of things? What do I need to know to support the behavioral health of my uh, coworkers and teams? The next is obviously it included in your wellness programs. Um, like I said, 97% um, of employee, employees acknowledge that mental health is important as part of their overall health, and it's absolutely connected. And many programs, especially post-2020, have these wellness programs be, built in. Uh, I want to challenge you to go and investigate. See what kind of counseling you have. See what kind of um, see what kind of physical health programs you have, what kind of discounts you get. Um, take advantage of them. Your company is paying for them. And third is, is that leadership and manager training. Obviously, you guys are a little bit ahead of the game because you're already coming to this training today. But overall, for companies, training our managers on, say, on psychological safety uh, to reduce that stigma associated with mental health is how we create psychologically safety, uh, healthy workplaces, those mentally healthy workplaces. Um, you guys are ahead of the game, like I said, because you're attending today, but sharing that with others, um, the, the return on that investment of understanding how uh, we don't, we don't, we no longer, you know, bring parts of ourselves to work. We bring our whole self to work. And that means that we have to expect that the whole self is going to have its, you know, connectivity. And so training your managers and your leaders to understand that and to be able to point people to resources and to make it well, welcome allows you to also leverage the productivity and innovation of a whole self. It allows you to leverage um, the loyalty that comes when, when team players feel devoted and feel like they've been heard and been welcomed and that they belong and that they're included, not just because they're a top performer, but because they're part of the team. So for immediate and systemic behavioral health needs, obviously there's a whole host and I want to include all of them. Um, there's behavioral health screenings. A lot of times there are, uh, and if you if you are looking for one, please feel free to email me. I'll send you a quick little link to a screening test. It's absolutely free. It will let you know if you're, uh, hey, do you know where are you in the risk for anxiety? Where are you the risk for depression? Are you just experiencing general overwhelm, or is it something that we need to look at? How long have you been feeling this way? So having those behavioral health screenings 
um, I'm happy to send that out to you. Also, we are we have a um, a mental health uh, newsletter that's coming out in beta, and you it can be absolutely free to you guys if you just email me and let you go let you know. I will send them out once monthly, and it just kind of has tips on what you can do with your team. It has a screening link, so you can take a screening, or you can send it out to everybody else. All of the information is anonymous, so it goes directly back to you, so you know where you are. Um, but it has tips on all of these. Suicide prevention, this is a big one. Um, it's very hard to talk about, and it's the type of thing that we don't want to come in and have to do crisis management, although it's part of what we do at Sula Sage. But we want to talk about it and make it open to prevent it from happening. Um, behavioral health literacy, there's obviously modules uh, but this training that you're at right now is is helping you a little bit more. It's educating you. Data analytics. I do challenge and, and actually want to open up the invitation for you to look at. If you're a manager, look at how many call outs you've gotten in, in the previous quarter. Look at who's using their vacation time. Look at who's systematically not using their PTO. And maybe offer, say, hey, you should you should take a break. I know you don't think you're burned out, but I can tell you right now, the human body's not meant to do that. It's not meant to sustain and not ever have a break. That's why literally the sun rests and the, and the moon takes over at night, right? So we should have a moment where we, where we shut down. Connection to resource. We've talked about the EAP system. And of course you have your, your, um, your you know, resources that you might have through your company um, but being able to know those and connect when you hear from co-workers right so when you're listening and you may hear hey I, I noticed that you've been you know I noticed that you've been short or I've noticed that this is coming back um, inaccurate which is not your normal workflow is not normally the way you work is something going on have you thought about checking out our EAP system? Have you thought about looking into our screening systems? All of those. We want to make these conversations more commonplace. It should be something that we're talking about on a weekly basis. Um, and then crisis management. Obviously, this is this is coming in after um, something bad has happened. You know, uh, and this is. Part of what Sula Sage does is we come in after there might have been a suicide or after there might have been a, uh, a natural disaster and we kind of help you manage that. Um, I always hope that when we introduce these things for psychological safety, that we can prevent the crisis part because that's what, you know, that's when things have gone wrong. Our hope is that we can create psychological safe environments where they're, you're feeling like it's mentally healthy and supportive and we can all progress and be innovative instead of having to have these hiccups in our productivity and at the very, you know, at the worst, these crises. So your key takeaways today, um, obviously creating that trust and authenticity and transparency in your communication is the foundation of a psychologically safe workplace. Um, decreasing that stigma and understanding that it impacts our view of mental health, of people that are seeking help, and our view of our coworkers. Um, that's a challenge that starts with us. It's something that we can begin to model. Um, and it's, it's not an easy thing, not because your workplace is uh, unfair, but because the American workforce was not a place that welcomed this type of uh, communication prior to, I would say, the kind of COVID era. Um, so this is coming up because, you know, after COVID, employees have had a lot of time to think about, you know what, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to do work as hard. I don't want to be always on. I don't want to be answering my phone in the middle of the night. I, I just, you know, I want to do my job. I just don't want to be worked tooth and nail. And so by creating these environments where you allow people to say, hey, I can handle this, but this extra stuff, I, I just, I start to feel overwhelmed. How can I delegate that? How can we create another process? How can we eliminate churn, not only in our organization, but in ourselves? Um, and companies can take real action by including mental health resources and behavioral health resources and wellness programs. Obviously, I am telling you most, most, health and wellness programs in the past couple of years have included very robust EAP systems 
If you don't know what it offers, I, I mean, they've got nutrition programs. Uh, I looked at one just the other day. It had nutri nutrition coaching. Of course, it had deals on rental cars and hotels and all of that, but your company is paying this. It's one of the things that we're using to actually um, create happy employees. So leverage it, leverage it, let it make you a better person. So in closing, I really, really enjoyed my time with you today. Thank you so much for engaging. Um, obviously, we do have, like Krista said, we do have some time for questions. Uh, I want to offer them up and let you be as anonymous as possible. If you feel like you have a question that you don't feel comfortable asking right now, but you'd like to ask me, my email is included um, in, in your handouts. So of course, those are welcome as well. My door is open to that. So now I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Krista so that we can go ahead and take some of the questions um, and, and certainly you know, open those up. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Trevina. That was a great program. Um, if you do have a question, you could submit it uh, a couple ways actually. Trevina still has the Slido open. So Trevina, I actually do see a question in there. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a question in here. So um, the question is, uh, our department was turned upside down and we were told not to talk about it. So how do you recommend we move on? Mm. <sighs> Your department was turned upside down and you were told not to talk about it. Um, that is extremely nuanced. I would, I'm gonna start with you. Um, because that's that's where I want you always to thought, uh, start. I want to start with you with how do you feel about that? Um, and once you're able to identify those um, friction points and or questions for yourself, the next step would be how do you take care of that for yourself, right? So sometimes when there are departmental changes and, and maybe our leadership says, listen, this is the way it's going to be. We're not going to talk about, it. we're not going to whine about it. And that creates some, some friction for you. That's the time for you to evaluate it, right? So figure out what it is that's creating some burn in you. Is it something that it's, you know, I don't agree with this, or I think this would have worked better. Perhaps it's because people were let go and you're feeling a little insecure about your, um, about your, uh, you know, future right so i what i first need to do is you to identify where's the burn for you in that where what's coming up for you in that and then the second step is looking at those things is it worth addressing is it worth bringing up with maybe your manager is it worth talking about with the coworker? is it worth talking about with leadership right so that's an extremely nuanced uh, because, you know, when you say that your workplace has kind of been turned upside down or your department has been turned upside down, I immediately think of workloads. I immediately think of reduction force. And I don't know if those things are happening, but yeah. So first examine how that lands for you. Um, how is that affecting you? And then the next step is, what now that we know, what what's the best next step? You know, is it something we need to elevate and escalate to leadership? Um, do you have a solution in mind? Do you disagree with, you know, what's happened and not talking about it? Um, that's another thing in my organization that I love uh, that we're starting is I love problems and I love solutions. And so obviously bring me any of your ideas, your problems, but maybe start thinking of like, perhaps we could do this. Perhaps this is a, a potential solution. Perhaps having a town hall where we are able to vent our frustrations. We know, you know, it may not change you, but just so you can hear our feedback. So those would be some of the suggestions I would give to you. Um, obviously, feel free to write back into the um, Q and A if you want to expand that question. But uh, that would be where I would start. Thank you so much. Um, I actually have a question for you, Trevina, and I'm, I'm sure you've probably heard this before in the training that you do with other organizations. But I tend to see, uh, even in our organization here, that um, things run differently in different organizations, in different departments, excuse me. So uh, one department may feel totally comfortable um, sharing grievances or or just, you know, letting it out and, and 
dealing with whatever is on their mind at that moment, knowing that it's safe for them to do so, knowing that their their manager would be um, sympathetic to that. However, in, in other departments, that might not be the case. There might be some trepidation, there might be hesitation or worry that there'll be retaliation um, for that type of um, communication. How would you recommend, um, you know, somebody combat that? Do, would you would you recommend that somebody from a different department um, maybe talk to a manager from another department, or do you have any thoughts about that? I would. Um... I, I absolutely would suggest that. I and you're right. You know, there are different personalities. There's different generations. There's, you know, and and sometimes your manager might not be the one, and you might just know this from past experience, right? Maybe they're the one saying something like, "Did you take your meds today?" Um, and I'm not going to get into the inappropriateness of that and and the the need to be that that type of communication to be escalated. But what I will say is that find find your safety, find your safe spot. Um, maybe that's a coworker, right? Maybe that's an agreement that you have with um, one of your teammates that it's like, okay, we know we can't go to our manager for this, but how can we as a team support one another? Um, I love to see that with teams. I love to see it like, hey, um, let me let me go ahead and take this off. I'm gonna handle this. I'll escalate this for you just because I know you're struggling right now. But the expectation is, I know that when I'm having a bad day, you're going to step in and take something off of my plate as well. So that's a, a wonderful way to create those pockets of psychological safety. Um, and I would say, you know, go with where you feel comfortable first. If this is your first time venturing into speaking about your um, mental health or speaking about what you're dealing with, find your person first it may not be your manager to start with but once you're able to create the space where you can talk about it whether it's with the coworker or another manager or maybe somebody in hr that gives you an opportunity to build some confidence and understand that like you know what hey this is part of me this is part of me my mental health my medication that i take my therapy that i go to that makes me be a better person and I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed of doing what makes me be a better person. I'm not ashamed of supporting myself to be a better mother, to be a better business owner, to be a better trainer. And so building those confidence muscles, it takes some time. So set yourself up for success by finding a safe place. Um, as you build more confidence, you won't care at a certain point, right? I, I now in business, if I'm really struggling, I'll say, you know what, I actually, I, my bandwidth is, is I'm, I'm at my max. I cannot, but I can handle this next week, right? So these are the communication and the languaging that we begin to adopt once we build those confidence muscles um, with psychological safety. So I would say to, to just kind of summarize, um, find your person. If that's another department manager, if that's a coworker that you feel like you can share, that you they can support you, you can support them, start there. Absolutely. You bring up a really good point and something we probably didn't didn't touch on, but plays a big role in how people uh, react and respond to to anxiety or mental health or you know just stress in general, is that generational difference, right? So older generations, probably Gen X included, you just kind of suck it up, right? This is it, this is what it is, let's suck it up. You don't, you just keep plugging away, keep moving, keep doing what you need to do. But I think there's probably a shift with um, younger generations entering the workforce now where they feel a bit more confident, um, even, even in their very early in their careers to speak up or to, to, to ask for the help that they need or um, acknowledge that they're overwhelmed or that you know they need something. I, I don't know if that's just me and my, my perception, but um, you know, I feel like there's, there's a shift. You're so on it. And, and I love that you bring it up. Um, interestingly enough, I'm gonna give a little bit of trivia because I think you probably remember years ago when we did the generations program. Right. And we talked about 
what different generations expect from the workplace. And some of this, you know, just kind of going through it very quickly for those that may not have seen it, I'm sure it's available in the library, but um, so those people that may not have seen it, it's uh, every generation is, is raised differently with different expectations, right? So our workforce was created by the uh, veteran administration. They're often called the side, or not veteran administration, forgive me, veteran generation they are often called the silent generation so that's that generation that's like you, you get your work done if you are having unfair treatment you suck it up you deal with it those that's who laid the foundation for the american workforce now you have millennials that are moving from um you know previous middle management to upper management positions and are starting to say you know what I, I don't feel like this is really supporting our whole self. And there's a lot of friction because we're looking at a workforce that has been virtually unchanged, right? Virtually unchanged since the beginning. Of course, they've added ADA laws. They've added um, women's uh, equality, pay equality, all of those things, EEOC. But virtually in terms of the hierarchy system and the culture of silence, it hasn't changed. And so you have this new crop of managers and now you're seeing things like quiet quitting or you're seeing people negotiate their salaries with a little bit more vigor or having different expectations of the workforce. And unfortunately, that's not gonna go away. The, the, the expectation that like, okay, well, they'll just get used to it. It's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. You won't find a, uh, a management company that will tell you that we're ever gonna go back to that. Um, but you can find advantages in that, and psychological safety is one of those. It's absolutely generational, and as you see the generations shift, the expectations shift, and it's our job to meet those expectations. That's great. Thank you so much. I don't see any other questions here, but Trevina, I think the next slide might be your contact information, if it's I'm not mistaken. It's actually contact. It's your contact, my contact. Uh, our contact, okay. Yeah. Um, well, we could pass along any additional questions you have. However, if you do want to, um, you know, just ask anything and not and not, um, you know, worry about anyone knowing what you're asking, uh, Trevina's contact information should be here somewhere. Yes, <laughs> she can pull that up for you. It's actually, at the beginning of the. Uh, our there we go. I I included it on the front end instead of the back end. I also yep. just put it into our um, question and comment box. So feel Perfect. free. To my email's right there. Um, feel, you, you know, it'll it'll get to me. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for your time. Thank Great. you. No, thank you. Thank you. And um, the recording of this webinar will be posted on ABC Omega's website on the webinar series page by tomorrow. And we usually send an automated uh, thank you email that goes out through the GoToWebinar system. So a link to that page will also be included in that um, uh, thank you email. So if you forget to check it yourself, you'll get an email reminder tomorrow as well. Thank you all for your time today. Thank you so much, Trevina, for this great presentation. It's so timely. Um, and, and you know anything to keep these conversations going is, is just a great thing. So we truly appreciate your um, expertise and insight and sharing it with all of us. My Before pleasure. you log off today, everyone, please do me that favor and respond to the survey that presents itself. We do look at those and any um, thoughts that you have for topics for next year would be greatly appreciated. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.